Well, hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen, and we are here, oh, sorry about that, we are here live on the YouTube page, I'm used to saying Facebooky page, but that is not what we are on anymore, and I do want to give a big shout out, we are actually, uh, hold on, let me, good thing I got this all brought up, um, got a new little supporter here, Beard Vet Coffee, uh, he actually came on last week before uh, anything had happened uh, really too special, but he supports a local, a regional late mall driver named uh, Jake Neal. We did some work with him, and he's been keeping up with dirt racing, really. He's never really been into it, and he says, you know, outside of Jake, but after watching my stuff, he starts to see all this sprint car stuff, this national late mall. It, it's just exposing, you know, him to the sport, and he jumped on uh, beardvet.com. Uh, you could check out some stuff. Over there, of course, uh, you know, helping veterans one cup at a time. And we do have on the other line, I know everybody's waiting to hear it. And, and all they care about, most people are here just because he's Kyle Larson's brother. And we understand that completely. Trust me, I completely understand. But Brad, do we have you on the other line? Yes, we do. And uh, thanks for the proper introduction there, huh? Well, I had to do it. I'm sure at least 60% are here just to just because you're Kyle Larson's brother-in-law. How, how well, is it being his brother-in-law? That had to come or, uh, with some kind of, you know, uh, situation, or have y'all just always been around each other? Well, I mean, obviously, as he as he got more and more popular, and you know, in NASCAR and, and won the championship, and but it was more and more, I think, uh, you know, at the racetrack, at least, you know, uh, a few times a night, if not, you know, fifty, sixty times a night, people were, you know, ask where he's at and. Uh, it gets a little annoying at times because, you know, I don't have a tracker on him and uh, I have a busy enough schedule myself. So I, so I do people actually is. come and, like, ask you, like, at an outlaw race, how's Kyle? Like, that actually happens? Well, it's basically like they want to know where he's at. Like, why is he not here? Is he coming tonight? And you're like, I mean, literally, you'll see, like, the NASCAR race on the TV or something. Like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> No, he's that's, not here tonight. That so. that that's those crazy ass Larsonites. I keep trying to tell and warn people about. You know, it's just insane, um, yeah. insane, absolutely. Um, obviously, you were on David Gravel's show last night, so it's it's kind of hard to to figure. You know what to really too much talk about, but I guess we could hit on all the same things. Obviously, Eldora Million was put out right before. Uh, y'all went live. Apparently, that was all timed and beautiful. Are y'all Illuminati with Kyle? What's the situation there? How did that? How did the David Gravel Alliance happen, or was it just a random text? Well, I think David's just uh, trying to work on his, you know, brand and and doing these talk shows. And uh, you know, David's a, a good friend of mine. I have a lot of respect for him, you know, on and off the track. So, you know, I mean, he's asking for uh, a favor and, and me to come on and and talk to him about this stuff and uh you know it was a fun conversation obviously we uh you know we're aligned in a lot of our thoughts and um you know he's uh always been you know friendly um and we we grace each other hard but he's uh you know he did a pretty good job last night asked some good questions and you know the million dollar to win race is still pretty surreal today to think about uh you know that, that you know we're gonna all battle it out for a million dollars at eldora next year so uh, it's pretty, I don't know, pretty uh, unreal that this amount of stuff has happened in one year uh, in sprint car racing. So I guess we got to thank the late model crowd a little bit for uh, for putting some pressure on us. Well, and it and I was talking to some late model people this year, and and you know, they're kind of halfway worried. Uh, they feel like there's a lot of money not going to be, even though this last year for the late models was was so great and grand that. You know, you take the Eldora Million out for them. Uh, you take out, uh, obviously, Bristol, I don't believe, is happening with XR. That was a big money weekend, two weekends in a row. Uh, they're just losing a little bit of, of steam here to where they're going to, I was being told by some promoters, a $5 million overall payout hit in comparison to this year that they're going to be faced well, with next year. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it definitely, you got to look at, and learn from, you know, what, what transpired there. Um, you know, not everything's going to be sustainable. You know, I think, uh, 
everybody's trying to figure out where this pay-per-view business model is going to fit in and the late models there's more opportunity on the the pay-per-view side because of uh the lack of control that any one series has it's it's pretty wide open so it allows promoters to put on big events and you know everybody's kind of fighting for their space and uh you know i think we're trying to be somewhat aware of that situation on the sprint car side and not uh you know not create something that uh kind of ruins you know the, the good parts of it so obviously we want to fight for you know uh, a little bit more money and and you know better opportunity you know or more chances to make some money as a driver that's where you do make your money is when you're in the race car racing it's the only place you make your money so obviously more races or higher paying races is is a good situation as a driver um but if you want to keep racing for big point funds and things like that i think there has to be you know some somewhat of some control uh in the situation it can't just be like the wild wild west and uh, I think that gets confusing with fans. And I think certain races, probably promoters thought they'd put big money and get, you know, all the late model guys to show up and some of them didn't happen. And, and so those races go away. So, you know, it's all about supply and demand in any, in, in any industry. And uh, it's no different when you're promoting races and uh, you're, you're fighting for, you know, the fans to show up. And, and if you, you know, if you miss and, and it doesn't go good, you lose a lot of money. So, uh well, uh, they don't have a contract situation over there in the late mile world like the sprint car world has been used to for some, for some several. I mean, long, long time. Um, yeah. It hasn't. It hasn't been. The opportunity hasn't been open. Obviously, you come in here with the flow situation and high limit, um, and then and then the Eldora Speedway deal happens. What is? Uh, I made a video yesterday saying, you know. You know, shine that shine that forty eight hours up real nice. Turn a hundred miles sideways and stick it up your candy ass. What is going to happen with that million being right there? I know y'all kind of broke it down in y'all's live, but I didn't catch that part. So, what's the situation, or is, or is everybody just assuming they ain't going to stop nobody? Yeah, I mean that's the case. I just like I mentioned, you know, yesterday. There's there's no rule that's ever going to be made that's going to stop you know, me or the other drivers, especially the elite drivers for racing for a million dollars. I mean, it's just, I mean, that's bigger than any series or any situation. And probably it could be once in our lifetime situation. We, we don't know, you know, that's, that's probably not an event that's a yearly event, you know, every year. It's a, it's a, you know, one off here and there, you know, to, to but, really, but technically you know, word for word, it, 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 it is in violation of that proposed, I'm going to assume proposed, uh, you yeah. know, four race, uh, 48 hour, hundred mile, uh, you know, proposal by the world of outlaws. It does technically violate that. I mean, I remember asking Donnie shots at the late model million. If I put on a million dollar race, he can't race it. And he's kind of responding, you know, nobody's going to stop, uh, somebody from doing <laughs> that. But I almost yeah. took that race that Stuart put out almost in response to that proposal. Like, no, that's well, not good enough. Well, it's, it, I mean, I think there's going to be stuff that's just going to fall into that very you know very back of the rule book the rule that says uh but we can still make whatever rule we want <laughs> so it's gonna i'm sure it's gonna fall under the exempt category uh in fact i didn't even ask brian and you know he didn't give me full clarity on it but he didn't act like that was something that we weren't going to be able to race obviously so uh like i said i mean it, it doesn't matter what rules there uh you know the race is paying a million dollars i mean you you know how many outlaw wins or championships you have to win to, to make a million dollars i think it's you know you're going to take the risk as a driver whether you lose platinum status or not i mean we're racing for a million dollars it's just that's just all there is to it it's kind of it almost makes me laugh when people think oh they're not going to be a- allowed to <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean i'm definitely going uh, i'm definitely you know going to have the napa auto parts number 49 battling for a million dollars there's just no doubt in my mind about that well how do you feel about that I guess I, I made a video about it saying it's a proposal. Obviously, I, I no, no post of who's all signed the World of Outlaw next year agreement. It, 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 and I was saying, you know, don't lose the power of no. Uh, is that four race, 100 mile, 48 hour deal something that you feel like? I mean, in our talk with Donnie Schatz, it felt like there he kind of alluded to a group of teams and drivers are together ready to make decisions on things in the sprint car scene. Is 48 hours, 100 miles, and only four races acceptable to, to the people in this in this game that seems to be being played in the offseason this year? 
I think it's, I think everybody's looking at it from, you know, their different points of view. I mean, you know, I think there's different tiers that go down the, down the list. You, you know, you have your three or four or maybe five guys that think they can actually contend for a championship. Then you have guys that are, you know, maybe trying to get top five in points. You have guys that are trying to, you know, run that through that sixth through 10th range. And, you know, I think there's businesses. In, in all due so respects, though, that this four race, forty eight hour deal ain't meant for Noah Gas. This is meant for no disrespect. No, I'm just saying this is meant for those top teams who want to run. I mean, without saying it, I mean the high limit races. This is that's what that's even out there for. High limits and other events. Obviously, this Eldora Million is going to be ex- and have an exception all on, all on its own. Apparently, I'm just saying that this isn't attuned to those guys that are. This this proposal isn't meant for those middle pack guys. This proposal is meant for the top drivers who want to go run at the high limit elite series. Well, I think that I think it's acknowledging that there's other bigger paint there's other big pain races out there and that and that the drivers and owners want the ability to go run to have the freedom to go run for a little extra if something pops up. And whether it be a high limit or a million at Eldora or some big all star race that falls in the middle of the week, I think you know, it's whatever the teams decide, and it's four, and you keep your benefits, or it's eight, and you lose that deal. So there's going to be guys in the middle of the pack, I think, that'll go ahead and run the eight freedom races, just because they'll have more of a chance to make the money back, you know, racing some high limit races. or. Some but other. they lose the bonus money, I believe, correct, if they go past the four and all the yeah, other stipulations. So why would a middle the, pack guy who's dependent on kind of show up bonus money to survive do that? Well, you don't lose your show up money. You lose the exclusivity bonus, which is right. just the end of the year to add it onto the point fund. So like in the middle of the pack, you know, that can be around 40 to $50,000 at the very end that you'll get extra. Right. But then or you make a decision to run four other races. Like if you feel like you could win one or two of them, you might make that money back. You know, and, and uh, you know, so I think that's going to be decisions that certain drivers in certain situations are going to have to make. I think it's going to be all over the map. And I think, honestly, you know, if you're having a bad year, you might say screw it and go just chase money. Or if you're having a – if you're leading the points and, and you're surprised that you lead the points, you might change your mind and, and just, you know, run for the point championship. It, it, I think there's going to be a lot of – you know, just because you sign a platinum agreement doesn't mean you can't change your mind, you know, halfway, three-quarters of the way through the season. Not saying that – you, you will or you want to, it just, you know, I think situations change and, and you see it every year, a team will be signed up and, and fall off or, you know, uh, something happens, some unforeseen circumstance. So, yeah, I think it's a pretty liquid situation. I think, I don't know that everybody has a clear path. I think the outlaws still need to give us some clarity on which races count towards the four. I mean, we wanted to gain, right? Like, we're supposed to gain a little freedom. Well, that's why I say, is four enough? I don't think it's enough. I think it's enough to say no. Well, I think the thing about the four is we've always had four. We've always had the Capitani. We've always had, uh, you know, the Oscaloosa race. And then we've also we've also always had four nights at Eldora. So, you know, we, you know, as race drivers, we wanted, we, what we were asking for and teams are asking for was, to gain a little something more, you know, not, not just a lateral move, not some optical illusion that makes, makes it look like we're gaining. We actually are asking for some sort of a gain, you know, some sort of meet in the middle approach. And if you're gaining four additional races and then eight, if you lose the benefits, but they were all additional to, to those Eldora races and those other races, then I think we would probably be, there's some clarity. I think you'd actually probably feel a little bit better about it, but there's some unknowns and, and the outlaws I think need to clarify that for the team so that, so we can make a bit, little bit better decisions or more, more educated decisions anyway. Well, I just think if there's this kind of group of people that are together and can make a, a, a group decision that, I, I just I just think in a situation where the I, I, like I say I see it as a proposal. It's something that doesn't necessarily have to be accepted. If there is this group like uh, shots alluded to that is making choices, you can you could negotiate, right? Because I think that what they're about to do, whatever is about to be set, they're going to try to hold the teams that have taken this on accountable in years to come. Like this four race make it or break it is not really going to move much. Whatever's agreed on in this offseason is kind of going to be the new setting stone for the outlaws going forward. That's where I would see it. So I think you kind of have to battle for your long-term ability as well. 
Well, I think you can have a group all you want, but if you only have one place to go race, then you're never going to have much leverage in a, a negotiation. And and honestly, you know, I, I think the owners were hopeful that there would be like more of a negotiation type situation. But I think Brian and the World Racing Group's approach was more like, we're listening. Here's, you know, a take it or leave it type offer. That's why it's more announced just to the public, not necessarily, you know, not, you know, behind closed doors. Right. Like, kind of negotiate. It's more like, here, take it or leave it. We don't really, you know, like, we're not doing any more. We're not doing any less. And you either come race with us and here's our deal or you don't. And then, uh, well, that's you know, very then, bad for sprint car racing for them to take that approach. Well, I think it's a, it's a short term band aid, but I think there's, it still leaves, you know, some teams and, and, you know, a, a group of owners that are investing a lot into the sport and, you know, making it all go around. I mean, you got to have team owners and these guys are spending a lot of money. They're asking for, you know, a little transparency or, or a little bit of freedom or something to help offset some of these costs. And, you know, I, I give Brian credit. He's done a great job uh, raising levels and, and, and doing things. And then I think what happened with the late model side, you know, created a open a can of worms and then the high limit thing, you know, made it even harder. And, you know, I think it's just a lot of pressure on a, on a vulnerable situation and he's trying to make good decisions for his brand. And, you know, now he has pressure from, from us and team owners and, you know, it's a, it's a tricky situation. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's just competition. It's basically, we'll figure out, uh, you know, a direction, I think, as we move forward, I think teams will make decisions. I think that'll, you know, kind of maybe speak to where people are at with the situation. Um, you know, you just, it's just all business. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of big races out there that aren't World of Outlaws, and that's, that's what's kind of, you know, making teams probably look at, at what direction they're going to go. Well, and, and I mean, I just, I just think at it, you know, if if I was in Carter's spot at this point with all the moving pieces, and you and you saw how quick the pieces can move on the late model side in just one year, I, I mean, I would think of something, you know, try to get to where the teams are liking to do a little bit better in four races, in my opinion. But then maybe try to approach not necessarily some of these teams, but there are some like a Tony Stewart racing, Casey Kane racing that you drive for, Todd, Todd Quaring, a, a Shark possibly of a potential of multi-year agreements on some type of agreement that's i sent you that video on nascar and you know that's 20 years if you could put sprint cars where where we're starting (laughs) now that's you know what we're doing with right now is what nascar kind of went through in the in the late 80s early 90s this is kind of that transition period um and and in that transition period you start you stop seeing the the one-year type deals you started seeing the multi-year agreements to where you started yeah. building franchises and those franchises are what gets the big cuts of the TV broadcast or are actually arguing in NASCAR to get bigger cuts because they're losing money. Um, so I, I, did, did that ever get brought up? Multi-year agreements under a deal with any of the teams? And what is your thought I mean, on I, that as well? I, I can't speak on necessarily like what maybe the group or the ownership group would would talk would agree upon because i i don't you know know that to be a fact but i definitely think if that discussion came up i don't think they'd be opposed to something like that i don't see why it would be bad for all parties if they felt like they were making a gain and you know there's some transparency and i feel like it would help the outlaws to to have three or you know two three four year contracts i mean i don't think that'd be such a bad thing for anybody um you know but it's just i think it's just it's hard because you look at all these other industries and like there's this transparency it'd be like dana white you know not telling his fighters what the pay-per-view numbers right were. and he comes out you and know, tells how, the media that how do you get how do you you know how do we get paid with only you know uh, uh the few people that are in the stadium watching when there's you know in in pay-per-view on like a fighter there's another couple million watching i mean that has to be part of the purse right it has to be part of the pay like just because the people are in the stadium you know, so, I mean, I think that's where it's always going to be hard is, like, we're going through a phase right now where pay-per-view is a part of the business. It's here to stay. I mean, it's And it's not replacing TV. Anything. Like, the cuts that you get with NASCAR that you see with TV, I mean, <laughs> streaming is where TV's going. Because the bigger difference here between streaming and TV is TV makes most of their money on ad revenue. Like, they, you know, Super Bowl ads, you sit here about how much they're you know, making off of that. They pay a certain amount to host the Super Bowl, then they sell these ads to make up for that payment and and profit. And in streaming, 
the reason most are going to it is because it's being paid per viewer now and you're getting yeah. that ad revenue. So you're getting two yes. streams of income being that that broadcasting network and it's streaming's the better way because everybody's got used to paying to view now. Uh, so it's a, it's yeah. a double whammy. The numbers are very important uh, and and for it to not be um, disclosed. Uh, it, it, everybody always makes this joke. I see some guys out there saying well, since streaming makes so much, you know, in a mocking way. But it's like yeah. if it if it didn't, then why are you hiding it? You don't hide or keep information <laughs> from someone that isn't valuable unless that number is valuable. Exactly. I mean, I think it just that's where the disconnect come from. I I don't think anyone's trying to be greedy or or come off as you know someone that wants to ruin what's going on. I mean, I think Brian deserves to make a lot of money, keep the, keep his business his business. I mean, he created their vision. You know, good on him. He did a great job. It's all part of his brand. I mean, that's badass, you know, but it's just too many numbers start swirling, too much stuff starts going around, and then the fact that he literally won't disclose anything, I think all of a sudden you start going, well, I mean, are we getting our fair share? I mean, then you start hearing about, you know, just different, just, there's just too many rumors. That's, that's the thing, and, and when you, they don't put them to bed, then it just keeps, you know, compounding and swirling and and then you get a pissed off group and, you know, these are your partners. These are the people you're doing business with. You need these people, the people as much as anybody to keep your brand alive. And the fact that you're not willing to share anything with them, you know, I right. think it puts a bad taste in their mouth. Well, and Shots brought up how, you know, when Ted Johnson was around, he felt like family. And I kind of responded to that. And I said, you're, he's like, I ain't felt that way in a while. Like, I'm family. And I'm like, hell, your family won't even tell you streaming numbers <laughs> or your car owner streaming numbers. I mean, that's yeah, a disconnect. And yeah, and obviously I'm going to probably, you know, take a hit here with the relationship side of things just because, you know, I think Brian's going to take it personal. Like his, his three, four-time champion here, you know, goes and, and goes against him. I just, you know, my my thing to that is, you know, this thing was – these things were happening – whether I was a part of them or not. And I had to make a business decision, you know, that was going to, you know, for my family and looking at the future. And, and honestly, I, I, I am very passionate about trying to raise the bar, you know, trying to, I'm a driver. So I know what it's like. I, you know, I'm involved in our team. So I, you know, I run the numbers with Casey. I know how hard this business is to, to make go around. I know what it's like to go out there and try to compete 90 times a year and, and, you know, have a bad year and only make a little bit of money or have a good year and make more money. It's, you know, it's a tough lifestyle. So if I can, you know, bring my ideas, you know, and ambitions, you know, and create a little competition and, and be a part of this whole conversation, uh, you know, my one goal is just to, to just try to help, help elevate the sport. That's it. Do you feel like, uh, do you, or do you regret at all not making this under the Dirt Vision banner because i feel like that's the battle more so than high limit versus world World of outlaws it's flow versus dirt vision i think that because we saw like uh you know last year there was a rain out or something happened here or there with the outlaws you could see gravel at Hussitz or sheldon at williams grove or or knoxville a dirt vision track i thought y'all had in Hussitz on the schedule was a pretty big deal obviously they got the lucas oil late miles going there with the silver dollar nationals that's a flow series as well um todd's known for being a, you know out of box kind of thinker guy as well and, and doing really great things so it's a great great alliance you got there uh but do you feel like if you would have just went the dirt vision route if you were proposed it to be under dirt under dirt vision that you would have any of these issues because i just don't think you would i think this is really flow versus dirt vision because it's not only the exclusivity to view you in the stands but it's also the exclusivity to view you via streaming if you want to watch outlaws this last year at all any other drivers you had to have dirt vision or go to the track with this new way of doing things they're going to lose that exclusivity not only at the track but online as well yeah i mean i i think obviously if it i think that's a you know, no, no brainer. Obviously, if it was dirt vision, it'd fall under there. But, but if it was dirt vision, then he would have he would have just done it himself, and he would have done it a long time ago. You know, I mean, he's he's in control of the brand and and the pay per view. So if he wanted to do a midweek series that you know uh, address the pay per view audience, he would have. But he he was never going to do it until you know this came out because he didn't want to open a can of worms. 
you know, the that that would entail acting like the pay-per-view is doing really well. And, and, you know, that would start incorporating pay-per-view more into the business model. And, you know, I don't think they're ready to, to get away from, you know, where they're at right now. It's, it's been working for them for a long time. And, you know, I think we're new and, and kind of have a different opinion on some of the ideas of how we're going to do things moving forward. And, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's just business. It's, we'll see who's right and wrong. And, I'm sure we'll go through some learning curves. I'm sure they're going to make some decisions. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I think 12 races was, was a pretty fair, you know, first first season for us. I, I felt like we didn't try to step on, you know, we could have done 20. We could have done 25. We could have done, you know, we could have been a lot bigger thinkers, you know, put a lot more pressure on the situation. But I think what we did was, was fair, and uh, I think it still fits in the ecosystem. And, you know, I think the racers, get to race, you know, for some bigger money on a Tuesday and Wednesday night. And that's really what it's all about is just trying to add to it a little bit. I, I hate that it's flow versus dirt vision. And what I mean, flow is the, where the opportunity was for us. Well, uh, I, I, it's funny you say all this is coming up right now because I did get a message actually earlier today from a high school wrestler guy. He's a little older. He used to be in there. And he was talking about how, uh, the the wrestling scene is like anti flow right now. Of course, that's where flow started because they basically monopolize the streaming services in the wrestling game. Um, if you kind of look at this, Dirt Vision is the mom and pop store. Everybody's the mom and pop store compared to flow. You know, flow yeah. would definitely be considered Walmart if there was one in in the dirt streaming game. Uh, does yeah. that worry you at all that that flow may be using you and your opportunity to take over the dirt racing or the sprint car SEMA? Obviously, they're 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 busting it up for sure. Not only just with you, but also Eldora. Yeah, I mean, I just think from our standpoint, we're just trying to look at the big picture of trying to make a good decision. You know, uh, there's always concerns in everything that you know every business decision you make. So you try to be as strategic as possible and think you know, three and five years out, it's just really hard to, to know what three and five years out looks like. Um, you know, is there more growth potential for the sport with flow in their platform or is there, you know, the other way? I it's, it's, you're never going to know. Um, <laughs> you know, I just think flow is a good partner. They've been a great partner for us. Uh, they have a great, you know, platform. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're willing to, to step up and, and, you know, help elevate the sport. Obviously, it's going to be beneficial because they're going to showcase it. But you wouldn't want to do it with some, you know, janky brand or something that you didn't trust. And you know, so far, uh, they haven't haven't shown us anything that we've been, you know, uh, afraid of. Well, I guess we could uh, turn over to the to the schedule. Let's get off of that. I mean, flow is is what <laughs> flow is. It could be something to worry about. Um, you know, you have a, a pretty good schedule here. You kind of threw everybody for a loop with the, there's like, oh, they only announced two. They must have dropped a race. And then they see the top there with Thunder Bowl. Uh, you know, obviously there was a lot of hits uh, with the new outlaw schedule on the West Coast. Did this decision happen prior to that choice for them to not do a swing? Was this originally planned to be in somewhere in that vicinity with the outlaws around? Or or how did or was this kind of like a reaction to them not having a West Coast uh, Big Four Ten race and y'all put that on? How did this come about? Yeah, that's a you know the latter of the two. There, it's obviously uh, you know we we didn't have any intention of going out west. Uh, you know, didn't think it was feasible or possible. Didn't want to you know try to put that on teams. There was already races out here, you know, in the spring and and then you know if the outlaws not coming out here and. You know, Kyle and I love Tulare. Um, it's a great racetrack. It's where, I, I honestly yeah. think that that track is where why uh, why the West Coast drivers can do so much damage. Because to qualify at Trophy Cup, you have to be willing <laughs> to destroy your car. You have to be willing <laughs> to put it on its lid. It is insane what happens in one and two at that track. Yeah, I just yeah, we just love it. I mean, Kyle and I. I mean, you know, we just basically are trying to help 410 racing out here. We. We got silver dollar. We, you know, we're running the mini gold cup in March to try to help. And then, you know, the high limit race at, at Tulare, you know, trying to get these 410 guys out here. It was a big hit for those teams and these racetracks out here when the outlaws kind of, you know, went the other direction. Uh, I understand why they did. I mean, I think there's a lot of pressure from teams, not myself 
personally, I love the spring California swing. I'm home an extra month out of the year. So, you know, I was disappointed. I don't, you know, the weather in Pennsylvania is, you know, more risky than in California, in my opinion. But, um, you know, so the opportunity was there, right? I mean, uh, we can do a race in March. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of cars out here, a lot of great drivers. We're hopeful that, you know, some outside invaders will, will get rides out here, kind of like Trophy Cup, and it'll create, like, some compelling, you know, different-looking show. And I think it, it's a good test for us to kind of, you know, step, go in our own direction and get away from, you know, the other schedule and just and do a race and kind of see how it goes. Um, you know, so you can't pass up a, a Tulare race on a Tuesday night for 23000 I, I think it's it's a, you know, probably – one of the best things that we did there yeah definitely and then the uh schedule kind of moves to lakeside and and, and honestly in, in Briar, brian carter's defense and the outlaws defense this is where i kind of did see where you know they're, they're worried i think you know this is kind of what they're worried about because the outlaws are at 81 prior to that race at lakeside which is obviously in kansas a couple hours apart still yes and then uh, the next week i believe the outlaws are at i-55 this race is right there on a Tuesday leading out of 81. If you're a fan and you're only going to go to one race weekend, you're more than likely going to go to Lakeside because you're going to get the Outlaws and Kyle Larson. If he doesn't put a lock on something to where people who may only want to go one night, they if they want to see the Outlaws, they got to go to 81. In the dream scenario, they don't have to anymore. They just wait till Tuesday and they get the Outlaws plus, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with some of that stuff, and, and I, you know, uh, obviously don't want to hurt promoters. I, I get, I try to be as fair as I could, you know, thinking about the schedule. I always try to go, you know, after an event. So, you know, you hope that people, you know, choose, and, and we're in the weekday, um, you know, but it's just the bigger picture here is trying to get, you know, to elevate, to keep pressure on, on this purse and this business model and make sure the drivers, you know, have a chance to race for the big money. So, you know, I mean, they have to react to this. I mean, that that's their reaction right now. You know, in a year's time, does uh, do all the purses get raised up and and there's back to full exclusivity? I don't know. I mean, the whole point is to try to drive it up and you know uh, keep pressure on the situation. It's you know at, at the end of the day, there might be some small or some short term losses, but it's the whole goal is to look at the long term you know, viability here and try to make some gain. Yeah, definitely. Uh, w when you had that first three hit, the Lakeside 34 Kokomo, I, I did see an interesting comment. I believe it was by everyone's favorite person, uh, Danny Dietrich. Yes, here, I mean, here it is. He, he says, I've never seen a series piggyback or piggy bank, it's piggyback, so bad. I'm very interested to see uh, some of the repercussions as the seasons go. Was it that the mission statement, though? I mean, what he's saying here is basically the mission statement was to give these top teams while they're on the road opportunities yeah. to make more money while they're going down the road. So I, I what yeah. what is your response to those out there like a Danny Dietrich, obviously, who's saying that it's just a, a piggyback series? Honestly, I don't I don't really get too worried about, you know, comments or concerns. I or like, you know, I, I listen to concerns. Yes, but just comments, you know, of, of people that, you know, have never been in our situations or, you know, Danny is a great racer. Uh, but and character. We need characters like that to say what they think. I mean, yeah. it is what, let yeah, them disagree, yeah. agree, whatever, you know. Yeah, let, let him say what he wants to say. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not like I'm going to go fight Danny Dietrich over it. I mean. Yeah, do, don't, don't, do don't I, have a Raymer situation, whatever you do. I mean. Do I look any, you know, do I look at Danny any different than I ever have? No. You know, do, is there guys that are shaking their head at our series? Yeah. yeah. You know, is there fans that disagree? Yeah. But, you know, the big picture, you know, not everybody's always going to agree on everything. You know, uh, what we're trying to do is is a little controversial. You know, is is putting pressure on the situation. You know, Danny probably was looking at this. Maybe he wanted to come to more, more of these races, the bigger paying races, and it's probably a little too much travel for Danny. I was about to. I was about to say he's probably. You know, he's like Lance. He's the old man on the porch yelling at everybody across the yard. Is that what you're saying? Well, and I, I, I think Danny is. is per, Pennsylvania is perfect for Danny. You know, it's a, uh, you know, him and, a, and him and a couple crew guys, and and they get to the track late, and they, 
you know, they're, they're scrambling because they've been working all day and, and he makes a living racing. He puts on a show, you know, he talks a little shit. It's, it's all good. You know, like there's no hard feelings that, that people aren't going to, uh, you know, agree with what we're doing. But when you've been out on the outlaw tour and, and, uh, you know, you want to, you know, you're trying to elevate it and you listen to the owners and you're listening to the drivers cause you're one of them and you're part of this group. And, and then the opportunity presents itself where you can help elevate it, you know, uh, Kyle Larson's your brother-in-law and calls you and says, you know, what do you think about this idea? And you sit and you really think about it. And you, you know, the opportunity with Flo is sitting right in front of you. I mean, it's, it's, it was honestly a really hard thing to, to want to pass up. I mean, it's, but that, uh, back to his comments, that's the mission statement. It is meant to be along the way. Oh, exactly. I mean, it, it's, you know, you're driving from point A to point B and in between you get to stop instead of you're just staying the night and buying a hotel room. You're stopping and you're racing for twenty three thousand to win and fifteen hundred to start. I mean, these are real, you know, these are legit purses that we put together. If we we wouldn't do this if we thought it was some, you know, something that wasn't legit and real and a game for everybody. Um, obviously, we can't look at it exactly from the World of Outlaws brand point of view. You know, we're we're fighting, you know, to gain, and so. There's going to be a little bit of hurt feelings, but it's all business. It's not meant to be like a personal, you know, fight that we're sitting here trying to have. We're just, we're looking at making business decisions that are going to be beneficial for, you know, the overall business of sprint car racing. And that's to gain, you know, put, to maybe change the business model a little bit. Maybe to acknowledge the pay-per-view, you know, that, that there is an audience during the middle of the week watching these races. It's it's part of it, and it's, it's here to stay. It's just the way it's going to be. Well... I know that, that, like I said, that was a part of the mission statement. And another part of the mission statement, which I think is here but isn't here on this schedule, is it was like to bring sprint cars to, and I'm paraphrasing here, to bring sprint cars to places that maybe don't get to see 410 wing sprint car racing. Um, I mean, obviously I think the biggest hit on this as far as good was Eagle. I mean, it, it, it's an amazing, amazing racetrack. Home of Kyle Larson's first World Outlaw win. Uh, it, it's a great racetrack. It hasn't had four tens in, I think, since that race or the year after, one of the two. So that's a big one that kind of nails the mission statement for sure. But these others, you know, these are kind of pretty, I mean, outside of Grandview, obviously they have their 410 winged racing over there. But some of these others are just traditional kind of, you know, I guess along the path but not necessarily a, a, a random place that is getting a, a hit for the first time of 410 winged racing. Uh, it, it just seems like w- what happened there? Was it, was it just collaboration? Was it just trying to make sure you hit a home run when you get to these places and you, and you don't lose money, didn't want to take too much risk? What was, what was the thing behind you know scheduling that? Like uh, a Lernerville and a Grandview and a Bridge, Bridgeport has so many 410 winged races. I mean, Lincoln Park and Kokomo, you can kind of see it in there. It's non-wing world mainly. Um, but, you know, 34 has their races. Lakeside has an outlaw race this year. Uh, Tri-City, I believe, has an outlaw race. Houston's obviously does as well. What was the thought process or, or the situation to where some people were expecting a Marshall Town or some people, I was hoping, Deer Creek or, you know, some of these... Yeah places that yeah, don't have wing 410 racing at all really hit their track that we just didn't yeah. get that what what was the process there yeah good question i mean it's uh it's very valid i mean you know there's there's a lot of logistics it was probably the, the hardest logistical thing i've ever put together is the schedule um you know we looked at tracks that don't have out our races that are you know for one you need a safe track for two we want we we don't want to go down the path of no not having a crowd, you know, that's, that's a bad look for everybody. It's not good for the promoter. It's not good for our series. And so we looked at places we thought we could, we could get crowds, you know, year one, um, you know, it had to fit along the lines of what was out there because that's what we told the teams, you know, you're not going to go way off the beaten path. You're going to be able to pick these races up, you know, easily. So logistics, uh, safe racetrack, you know, tracks that we know could race and put on, produce great racing for fans. Cause that's what high limits is about is trying to find, you know, the Eagles and the Kokomo's and, you know, the Putnam Bills and, you know, Kokomo doesn't have a lot of wing 410 racing. Putnamville doesn't have much wing 410 racing. You know, Grandview doesn't have an outlaw race. Bridgeport lost their outlaw race. Tulare lost their outlaw race. 
you know, yeah, Lakeside, uh, that that was a tough one, but you needed a venue that could handle a 50,000 to win show. Lernerville doesn't have an outlaw race. You know, obviously, that's a place that, you know, is one of the best tracks in the country that should be showcasing the best drivers. That was a no-brainer to go there for 50000 to win. Uh, Granite City, Illinois, right on the way uh, from – we go from Lawrenceburg all the way up to Grand Forks. It's a long drive. To pick that up on a Wednesday night, and it ties into the NASCAR crowd, the NASCAR races in St. Louis on the Gateway. Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it was there's a lot of logistics to put this thing together. And then, you know, you get towards the end, and, and yeah, you know, 34 Raceway – um, you know, coming out of Knoxville on a Tuesday night, it it has an outlet race, but there's not a lot of venues that you that you can go to in that area where you know you you know we still want to have the crowd. So we thought that track produces good racing. Uh, there'll be a lot of cars out in that area, and you know we only we only put one half mile on. Um, you know we wanted to stay on the shorter tracks. Obviously, Eagle no brainer, like you said. Um, Houston. You know, tying into Jackson, I mean, we think it helps the Jackson Nationals with, you know, cars staying around after the Knoxville Nationals, you know, it helps uh, Todd up at Jackson to, to potentially create create a more compelling Jackson Nationals. Uh, you know, so 23 grand on a Tuesday night, everybody's going to be in that area after Knoxville heads to Jackson Nationals anyway. You know, so it's an extra show right. for everybody. La- this last year, that's where I had my issue, where y'all had the Lincoln Park directly after Knoxville that kind of detoured them. So this is bringing them yeah. back in a way. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's bringing it back. And it's also, you know, last year we knew we did, you know, everybody was under contract. We knew that we, we weren't going to have a chance to get, you know, those drivers. Uh, so, you know, I think overall, uh, <laughs> this schedule's really, really good. I think it, it checked all the boxes. <laughs> you know, will we will we grow from here? Will we change tracks? You know, we're just we're worried about uh, the inaugural year. Put on some good racing this year. High Limits is going to do some cool stuff. You know, we're we're super passionate, super excited. Uh, you know, we really don't want to hurt anybody. We don't we don't want a lot of hate. You know, we know we're going to get a little along the way, and we're going to get some disgruntled people and and some old traditionalists and some. You know, the old boys club is, is maybe getting broke up a little here and there. But at the end of the day, it's, it's all business. It's all, uh, you know, basically what we're trying to do is elevate the sport. Um, you know, we love sprint car racing. Uh, you know, Kyle Larson didn't have to do this for sprint car racing. He could have went many directions with his likeness and his ability to draw a crowd. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's helping uh, guys like me and, and David Gravel, Donnie Schatz, and even – even Danny Dietrich. Even, like even Double D, man. Even Double D is going to get the race more money this year. And Freddie uh, Raymer. Are y'all going to yeah, promote? Are, are, are y'all going to have me down there with the mic promoting and, and making people mad at one another? Is that what's happening? We we can uh, we can if that's what the crowd wants. But the high limits is all – we're going with the casino theme, and, and we're, we're putting up big money, uh, you know, rolling the dice, and, you know, we're going to announce some cool things that are going to be – you know, things that we add on. So we, we always support, or we always love the support of the Chaz, and you're welcome anytime as long as you don't, you can be a little objective, but as long as you're not, uh, you know, bashing us too bad, we'll always have so, you So, well, my only real issue I've, I've had is with provisionals. Now, I'm sure y'all will have some provisionals. Like, I, is Jimmy Johnson oh, going to run a sprint hell, car or no? Hell no, hell no, we're not having no provisionals. No provisionals. Oh, now, now, this no. is something I did see. That I don't know if it's true or not. I saw somebody talking how it's it's ninety dollars if you don't make the no. A. What's up with that? Ninety dollars. Come on. Somebody $90. was saying this. I didn't say this. Maybe if you're in the C main, but come on, man. I mean, you know, I mean, at some point the, the pay falls off. But it does yeah, it go to ninety dollars? I think the C main. I think on uh, industry standards, probably what a hundred bucks. Yeah, to, to run non qualifier, hundred bucks, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think our B main, like first on transfer in the B main, I think starts at five or six hundred bucks, and and uh, it trickles down. But I mean, you know, it's a uh, the A main is fifteen hundred to start. You know, these are big, these are big purses. So obviously, you know, you you're gonna want to be making the A's. I I get that we want to trickle it down as far as we can, and I understand that. 
Um, but and and maybe we'll work on that as we as we move forward. But I think they're pretty legit purses. I think you know you, you're not. It's not an outlaw field every night. You got to remember that. There's going to be a lot of drivers that are going to be sitting there watching these races, and there's an opportunity for a lot of local teams to make these shows at fifteen hundred bucks. I think it's going to help everybody involved. Well, now that is a very interesting a commenter that just kind of hinted to it, and I should have brought it up earlier. Are you going to be transparent with any teams or drivers that will run the the high limit series as far as streaming is concerned? I'll, I'll share as much as I as much information as I get. You know, and that's uh, that's something that, like when I mentioned earlier, I said it's you know we have to be strategic in in any negotiations because you know if we're going to be doing this stuff, we we definitely need to do a better you know we need to be putting our our uh, money where our mouth is and and uh, we we basically have to you know, uh, acknowledge that that's what people are going to want to see. And, you know, I, I don't know exact, uh, you know, exactly everything we'll be able to share, but, uh, you know, we'll definitely do our best to, to give everybody, you know, any information they need to help sell sponsorship or, you know, anything that we can to, to help move the needle for everybody involved. Now, what is it, or is there any potentiality to add events in this year? Uh, I mean, we don't want to right now i mean has it been really discussed focused. at all it's a possibility basically uh i mean in in my mind uh that's not not re- not realistically no like not not something that we're trying to do at this moment but like i told you it's a liquid situation you know if uh if the opportunity presents itself things are going good you know uh and we don't think we're hurting anything then then maybe yeah an event or two i don't know i mean if we rained out or something or needed to add an event you know, I'm just not going to say that we're we're not, but but I mean that's not the intent right now. No. Would that be like a higher highest bidder, or what? How would that even shake out if you rained a date out? Obviously, it's it's uh, the schedule's based on an outlaw kind of swing. Um, yeah, how- we, we have we have we have other events that that other promoters that would have liked events that we that we weren't able to fit in this year. Um, you know that we put, you know, kind of on a on a list. You know, just basically, um, you know, that we would we would like to go to um you know eventually uh and maybe this year will present itself it's just hard to say you know i'm seeing a lot of interesting comments uh there people are keep, keep bringing up usac you had a stint in the usac ranks right or no am i incorrect there yeah i did yep I had, and that's how I you had, went to now you kind of did the whole nascar track i believe at that point right and that's a, you know that's a bait you know just because i i don't i'm running out of time so i'm just going to jump right into it because i understand the debate because I, I was there uh the problem the difference is the races that we're stepping out to race, I'm not going to race for 1500 bucks at a local show. If I'm stepping out on the world of outlaws or taking a freedom race, I'm going to race for 25, 50 or million dollars. I mean, that's, those are different types of shows. Those are shows that are moving the needle for your race team. You know, I get the, the debate of oversaturating the Indiana market, you know, and, and fans can see you race for 1500 bucks down the road. So they're not going to go to a USAC show. I get that, but at the end of the day, this is meant to try to elevate, you know, so if, so if the world of outlaws want to win, they got to elevate their purses. I mean, it's, it's just plain and simple. They're going to have to up their game, you know, at the end of the day, that's all. At at the end of the day, this, uh, that's not where I was going with that USAC deal, but nice for you to point (laughs) that out. Um, at the end of the day, I've been making a joke saying, if you want to have the baddest hoes, you got to be the pimp that pays the most, you know, I mean, that's what. At the end of the day, y'all are in a money game, and if they didn't want any of this to happen, they could have paid more, you know, and not blame track promoters. They could have took more of a cut from streaming. And if y'all if y'all weren't worried about making a few more bucks, y'all wouldn't be complaining, you know. And it's more so about the crew cheese and the and the and the car car cheese and and the tire guys. Those are the ones that are really, uh, you know, needing to get more more money. And and for that to happen, it has to be from the top down. You know, the teams yeah, just, have to get more. I think it's just, yeah, I just think it's just a, a transparency. It's a battle to, to, you know, try to elevate the sport. It's, it's not a greedy situation. I mean, it's no different than I've had to live my last, you know, the, my whole life of how I earn money has always been based off performance. So, you know, it, it, it's, you know, whoever's going to perform at the highest level is going to win. And whether that's in anything you do in life, and that's business as well. So, you know, uh, a little competition, you know, I'm used to competition. I'm used to be back in the corner and, 
you know, just doesn't really scare me. It doesn't really bother me to, to hear people, you know, upset or, or anything. I know what my intent is. I know what the goal is. And, you know, I know I'm not really trying to harm anything here. It's just, it's just all, it's all business. And, and I hope it, uh, you know, hopefully we do a good job and, and I hope people enjoy the shows and, and I hope it elevates the sport. Well, my, my point with the USAC deal, we'll get out of here real quick. The reason I even brought that up is I was curious to get your thoughts on uh, I, oh, pers- I, I I was just going to say, I personally think that the, the sil- people started bringing up Silver Crown. And, and if you go research dirt enough, Silver Crown racing, champ car racing, used to be the outlaws of dirt. I mean, that used to be the top level. Uh, 30,000 to win in the 70s, people used to think A.J. Foyt, Mario Andretti ran them for fun. No, that's that was a lot of money uh, back yeah. then. That series has basically tanked to what it used to be. It's coming back slowly. Uh, what, what do you think of the Silver Crown car itself? Because traditionally, it, it's supposed to be a representative car of the one of the top levels of dirt racing overall, uh, and it's just yeah. not there anymore. Yeah, I mean, I love Silver Crown cars. I, I mean, I'm a traditional, you know, uh, open wheel fan. So I mean, I've driven Silver Crown pavement cars. I never drove, you know, Silver Crown dirt car, but uh, you know, always enjoyed watching them. I think it's, you know, there's a lot of empty dirt miles sitting out there that, that they're perfect for and uh i love 100 mile races it's a it's a different type of racing it's, it's great i mean there's nothing you know uh they they can run in the afternoon on a sunday i mean there's a lot of uh, great things they have starters they they're they're a different type of car uh you know they go way way back it's you know definitely a a form of racing that i hope you know uh can build it back up to, you know, 15 great events and, you know, fill, fill that void that, that I'm sure there's some racetracks out there that need. Sounds like a high limit silver crown series. That's what it sounds like to me. I mean, that's honestly well, what it sounds like. Put them on some quarter wait, miles, three eights, let them, let them, let them race. Wait. Yeah, they're just they're big and bulky. I know. They I know. They're, they're a big block and, modified without the body is what they are. Yeah, and, and USAC, I mean, you know, we don't want to, we wouldn't want to mess with USAC on that stuff. If they're trying to revive something and they're doing the right thing by that, I mean, you know, we we would always support them on that stuff. Well, this is very so. true. Speaking of revival, what's it going to take to get the Gold Cup to 50K? Uh, man, I just, I need probably another year or so. I mean, we'll see if the crowd, you know, we, we had our crowd last year and our numbers and uh, you know, I, I, I mean, definitely the goal is to not, def- not even stop at 50 K just so you know, I mean, obviously we wanted to say a hundred and be, you know, in the conversation of all the big sprint car races, but we need, you know, we need a couple of years to revive the thing. It's, uh, we did a, I thought we did a pretty good job this year with, with what we were, what we had in front of us and, you know, where the events been. Um, but there's, you know, a lot of work to be had and, uh, you know, hopefully after this year, if we see some see some growth and we can get some kind of numbers and, and some actual projections of, you know, trajectory of where the business is going, where the race is going, uh, fan, fan wise, you know, then maybe we could actually give a better answer there, but, uh, it's definitely the goal, definitely on my, you know, three to five year, uh, you know, board that I always make every year that, you know, uh, I'd like to make the gold cup, uh, you know, uh, obviously the biggest, you know, West coast, uh, sprint car race. Definitely. And, and and Chico, I'm surprised, you know, like I, I lived in Chico or kind of lived there for like three months at one point when I was doing a bunch of stuff in California. And it just surprises me how disconnected the, the college and town just is. It's right there, too. I mean, is, the, is how hard is it to actually whittle into there or, or in some form or fashion? Yeah, we, we, we're definitely working on it. I mean, tell you that boots on the ground approach should you know, uh, you got to perform at a high level because we lost all the fans. And so every time we get, you know, a few extra people, we got to put on a great show. And, uh, you know, you got to you got to hope for organic growth because I've ran TV ads and, you know, handed out flyers and, you know, done billboards and radio and everything I can do. And, and we had some great shows, but it's just it, anything, you know, promoting anything has to be it's, it's a it takes a long time. It, it's really easy to lose the fans, but it takes. 10 times longer to get them to come back and they lost the fans they created a disconnect with the city and mm-hmm. and uh you know now we're trying to rebuild the connection with the city and and remind people that we're out there and that we're quality entertainment and you know it all it all starts with you know uh putting on a lot of great events and, and good shows and we did pretty good last year but 
uh, hopefully this year we'll, we'll do even better. All right, all right. Well, last question. Last one here. Okay. Yep, What's, yep, yep. I heard some stories out of the Promoters Workshop in Reno. Um, what is this new sprint car tire about? What's going on? I heard there's something going on. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's anything crazy, to be honest. I think uh, Hoosier didn't, wasn't real transparent about, you know, it, it coming out. But uh, uh, it's basically the right rear is got no camber in it, so you can flip it around. And it's a, a few points harder on the durometer. So uh, the mindset is that it should last longer. And for local teams, they should be able to flip it around and maybe get two, three, four ninths out of it, uh, depending on track conditions, obviously. Uh, and then the left rear uh, is really similar, uh, just just a few minor changes. Uh, but they made new molds, so for it sounds like the rear tires, tires, both sides. Yeah, just rear tires, and all they're trying to do is ramp production up. Uh, you know, so it's just it's just trying to basically produce uh, tires faster. The demand's just been too high; they have we don't keep up. So, you know, build a new mold, have less issues, and then you know, hopefully. Honestly, what they're trying to do, which is crazy, you know, in any business, is actually to drive the demand, you know, down a little bit with, with the longevity of the tires. So, yeah, I mean, it's been crazy to, to see that because usually you'd want to sell as many as you could. But I think Hoosier has the right intent. I think uh, it's a tricky situation. Um, you know, obviously, um, they, they're, they you know, the only game in town for us. So we need them to perform. And it's the only way our racetracks and series stay alive. Okay. Well, I guess we'll let yep. you get out of here. I know you told me you didn't have too long tonight. We're just over yeah. an hour. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, good questions. Uh, you always keep the pressure on me, and uh, I don't mind it at all. I don't I don't mind the tough questions. Uh, we're excited for this year, so hopefully people will uh, come check out our High Limit series, and uh, whether in person or on the streaming, and you know, hopefully we'll put on some, some good shows for everybody. All righty. Well, thanks for uh, calling in. We'll Catch you next time. Okay, thanks. See ya. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was Brad Sweet on the line. Uh, Want to give a few updates. Had a lot of good stuff going there. We're going to be doing a little uh, segment cutouts and putting those out here on the YouTube channel to come. Also, tomorrow night, we're going to be having live on the channel at 10 p.m. Eastern. I know this was a little bit early for some people out there, um, the 7 p.m. Eastern time slot. Tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be having live here on Long Live the Chaz, Tim McCready. Now, obviously, Tim McCready is a late model guy, but he has ties to everything. He's won the Chili Bowl, and he is the defending Lucas Oil Late Model Series champion. And the late model world, you know, seems like around $5 million being pulled out of that industry. And then, uh, you know, Lucas Oil doing their chase for the championship. I'm assuming he's got some opinions on that. It's going to be a good show tomorrow. We're going to have a whole list of questions, whole list of, uh, hopefully, viewers in here. But Tim McCready live tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Fendered fans, you want to turn in. Sprint car fans, you want to turn tune in. Because Tim McCready's a smart guy. We're going to be talking about high limit. We're going to be talking about Eldora Million being sprint cars. We're going to talk about this big block stuff, flow, dirt vision, uh, all these different things. We're going to be talking about it. He's in the game, too. He's in the game. It's a smart guy. So Tim McCready live tomorrow night on 10, at 10 p.m. Eastern. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to support Beard Vet Coffee Company. New jumper here on the show, right there, right, right as I talk about him, right there. Serving vets one cup at a time. I made that up my damn self, and I think that's really, really cool. So, Beard Vet. Also, if you want to be a part of the show, links are in the description. You'll get your uh, logo name or whatever you need up there at the top right of the screen as well. But anyways, until tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern, live here with Tim McCready, we will catch you next time. Be sure to subscribe, like, and share the video. See you next time.